start up that recording. It's running and, now. Uh, all right. Welcome, everybody, to Become a Cybersecurity Ninja, the 10-part webinar series. Today's session, Your Passwords Are Broken, How You Can Fix Them. And we have with us, I'm delighted to, to say, Keith Berner of Freedom House. And we will uh, let him introduce himself in just a minute. We're going to kick it off. Uh, I just want to walk everybody through our ninja plan. So we've been through threat modeling, which we did back on the 24th. All of these recordings, all of these slide decks are available for free. Uh, all of the future slide decks and recordings will be available for free and shall remain so. So if you miss any of these and you'd like us to send them to you, just let us know. You can just email us the roundtable if you can't find them. They're also all available from our website. You can just go to our events page and you should be able to find all the back ones. And uh, Keith, just as a heads up, I'm still hearing uh, a bit of breathing on your side. No big deal, but, but uh, it's okay. And uh, so anyway, we did uh, threat modeling. We did network security basics. Today we are covering authentication, passwords, password managers, and 2FA, or your passwords are broken. And next session is the at dollar sign pound sign of encryption, communication, information, and device encryption. And that will be in two weeks. Uh, I, of course, am Joshua Peske, Vice President of Technology Strategy at Roundtable. Roundtable, of course, team of dedicated technology professionals operating out of Maine and New York. And I'm not going to take too much time in Roundtable because I want to give Keith the floor. Keith, tell us about yourself and Freedom House. Hi, everybody, and sorry for breathing into my microphone. I've uh, now moved my <laughs> mic a little further from my face, so hopefully you can still hear me without too much breathing. Yeah, so to be I've clear, been though, we do definitely want you to breathe, Keith. <laughs> okay, good. Yeah, we were joking before we started that I might just hold my breath for the whole webinar. Um, so I've been with Freedom House for four years. Freedom House is an international human rights and democracy organization. The nature of what we do angers authoritarian governments around the world. So security is a big factor in what we do. It's how we keep our staff and our partners on the ground in dangerous environments safe. We take these things very seriously. Awesome. Thank you so much, Keith. And thank you so much for joining us today and for your help in giving me feedback on the slide deck today and helping develop the, the deck and the resources you've sent. It's been a huge help. So what we're going to talk about today is, of course, passwords. And the first step toward recovery is admitting you have a problem, and the problem is passwords. And we're going to take a little bit of time. I, I hate to be one of those like depressing, the sky is falling kinds of things. but in the And I've tried very much not to have that tone in the, these sessions in general, and I will continue to not have that tone. However, in the instance of passwords specifically, while there are lots of things you can do to mitigate the problem, passwords fundamentally are broken. And we're going to talk over the next few slides as to why that is true, why they're broken. And then we'll get into, as quickly as we can, all the different things you can use to try to make them less broken or to fix them, such as password managers, single sign-on and using enterprise password managers, two-factor authentication, which is probably the easiest tool that you can start using right after you get done with this webinar or tomorrow or as soon as you can. Um, and then, of course, we'll give you, as usual, resources for further learning. First poll we want to ask is, what do you think is the average number of accounts Reg wow, I didn't break that badly. Uh, what is the average number of accounts registered to a single email address in the US? So essentially, how many, now most of us have multiple email addresses, but how many accounts online are registered to a single email address in the US? What do you think is the average number? Do you think it's less than 25? Do you think it's 26 to 50? Do you think it's 51 to 100? 101 to 200 or over 200? And let's see what we get. We'll leave that open just for a few more seconds. All right, Ben, go ahead and show us the results here. And then I and will. While that's, uh, while that's coming up, ahead. I wanted to add one thing, which is that poor password hygiene is one of the major ways in which identities get stolen and uh, accounts get hacked. Yes. <laughs> and it is a major one. So uh, people had answers all over the place, and this kind of depends how you you know want to allocate it. But the actual answer, according to Dashlane, and I have the the source listed in the slide, is 107. So 107 accounts uh, registered to single email address. Keith has over 200. He is saying, Ben, go ahead and close that up for me. All right, and uh, just in case anyone's wondering, I believe I wrote down in my notes how many I have. It's about 320-something that I have in my laptop account. So that's a large number of passwords that we all have, and that's part of the problem. So 
the next slide we have up here is to, to point out that one, two, three, four, five, six is of course the best password that you can use. And we have two here. So LinkedIn, I think, you know, will give those folks a little bit of a break for having a weak password because they're just trying to set up an account on LinkedIn because maybe they're about to leave their job and they weren't really trying very hard. The Ashley Madison folks, however, if you're not familiar with Ashley Madison, it's a site for uh, ostensibly married people who wish to, you know, have affairs with other married people who are not their spouses. So you would think that these people would be a bit discretion oriented and might be a little more security cautious because of that. And yet, one, two, three, four, five, six is still, by a factor of more than two, the most popular password on Ashley Madison. So one, two, three, four, five, six best password that there is. So the actual best passwords, in case anyone didn't catch the uh, sardonic tone of the previous message, or previous slide, uh, are these incredibly long gobbledygook, uh, complex, random, alphanumeric strings, right? Length is, is a really important factor in passwords. Complexity is an important factor. Uh, and then you'll notice that this third one, speckled rambling, tried runners, green buildings, that is, and you can go ahead and plug these into any password checker tool that you can find if you Google, you know, password checker tool, you'll, you'll find a number of sites where you can plug passwords in and see how strong they are. Uh, the speckled rambling tried runners greening buildings is in fact, I believe stronger than the other two that are there, um, or certainly as strong. And the reason why is that it's a very long password. So even though it's English words, it's still a very strong password. And that's a passphrase, which makes it easier because human brains are not good at making and remembering long, complex, and random alphanumeric strings. And because I know people can't read and listen at the same time, I'll give everybody just a moment to read the cartoon there. And uh, so obviously that's a little bit of a problem. And then, of course, it gets worse. So this is, remember I said I, I was going to be a bummer? So this is the part where I'm a little bit of a bummer. So even complex passwords aren't that great. Why aren't complex passwords that great? Well, they can still get fished, and we haven't talked about phishing <laughs> yet. Uh, we will, uh, I believe, two sessions from now when we have the gone phishing, where we talk about social engineering. But phishing is a technique that someone can use to get you to enter your password into a system that isn't the system you think. So basically, someone can send you like a, a login failure notice from what seems to be Gmail and you click on the link and it shows you what looks like a Gmail account login except it's a fake website that's been built just to harvest the password that you enter into it. So if you do something like that, if you fall for a phishing attack, then you, I, then it then doesn't matter how complex your password is, your passwords will now have been breached because it will be captured by that service. They can still be reused in multiple places. You might have a really good system for making a complex password, like a combination of your name plus your kid's name plus your birthday plus your friend's birthday uh, plus other things. And, uh, and so if you reuse those passwords in multiple places, then if it's breached in any one place, then it can be breached in all the other places. They can still be shared in insecure ways. So you might email your password to somebody else, which is generally a really bad idea if you're sending that email over unencrypted text. You can, you might write your password down to post it. You might text it to somebody. You might, in any of a number of ways, you know, put it in a spreadsheet, put it in a document. There can be all kinds of challenges there. They can obviously still be part of a larger breach like Yahoo, like LinkedIn, like Chase, like any other thing. Um, and they can still be captured by keystroke loggers. So if you get malware on your computer, or if you're using a computer that has malware on it, or if you're using a terminal where someone has installed a keystroke logger and you put in the password, then this wonderful complex password that you have can still be breached. So I hope that in the first nine minutes of this webinar, we will, um, you know, not depress everybody thoroughly, but I'm gonna let Keith talk just for a moment here because he has a couple of points to make. But I just wanna say, well, go ahead, Keith, you make, you make your point here. Sure, well, I typed into the chat, first of all, um, when uh, Joshua rightly says even complex pa passwords aren't great, he's identifying some of the problems with them. But in fact, long complex passwords are great if you practice good password hygiene around them. And we'll get to some solutions. The major problem with them is it's hard to remember them, even if you're using those kinds of passphrases rather than random characters. If you've got too many of them, they're hard to keep track of. One other thing I'll notice is that 
it's not necessarily completely unsafe to write them down on a piece of paper, as long as it's not a sticky note attached to your computer. However, one rule of data management is no piece of data you care about should ever be in only one place. If you're going to write your passwords down on a piece of paper, it can't say, this is my Facebook fat password followed by the password. You have to use some sort of clues to remind yourself. But here's the other thing. If you're going to keep track of anything on paper, make a photocopy of it, store that photocopy away from where the, your main resource is, and anytime you update it, remember to make a fresh photocopy. That's just like backing up your data. Thank you so much, Keith. I really appreciate that. All right, um, so now that we've sufficiently distressed everybody, we're going to talk about password managers. Password managers to the rescue. And we're going to yes. just quickly launch a quick poll, and we're going to ask folks, uh, Ben, if you can go ahead and launch that up, do you use a password manager for your personal accounts? So if you don't use a password manager, please select no. If you do use one and it happens to be LastPass or 1Password or KeyPass, please go ahead and choose that one. And if you use another password manager, you can go ahead and type that in. And you can, if you, if you don't mind telling us what password manager you use, you can throw that into the chat for us. And if you'd prefer not to tell us, then of course you can uh, just, just keep that uh, to yourself. And we'll leave that open just for another second. Ben, why don't you go ahead and show the results of that? And so, Fortunately, we're doing this webinar today to an audience that largely uh, hopefully can benefit from it because over half of you are not using any password manager. Uh, of those and I've got to say, oh, go ahead. Joshua, if we have one result out of this, I'd like to see, if they were a follow-up poll, I'd like to see that number 57% drop to zero. If we accomplish nothing else, we will have really done something here, if that's the result. And I would love to to get that. Um, you know, I think zero percent is a high bar, but we'll go for it. Yeah. And uh, we've got other people uh, just just to catch everybody up. We have some more LastPass users. We have Dashlane, uh, which was another one. I just uh, I was only had go to webinars so irritated and only give you five choices. So I, Dashlane would have been the next one I would have put in. Norton's Identity Safe is another one that someone listed in there. Uh, so thank you folks for for all that. All right, and let's get back to it. So top password managers, and this is not in any way a, a, a endorsement of any one of these password managers, uh, but LastPass, this was from Lifehacker, January 2015. So Lifehacker is a reasonably tech-savvy community of users, you know, depending on your, your view of Lifehacker, but uh, generally speaking, that's a fairly savvy group of folks. So their ratings are the best password manager, 43% of them like LastPass, uh, one password was next to 26%. KeyPass was next at right around 20%, and then Dashlane and RoboForm were in there as well. So just to give you, those are kind of a top five, and and those are certainly all ones that I've encountered and used, and I, I like all of them in different ways. And and by the yeah. way, uh, Keith, oh go ahead, Keith. Yeah, I was just going to say. Uh, here at Freedom House, I uh, am using LastPass for myself and for all colleagues who will follow my guidance. In my personal life, I'm using 1Password. Um, and Joshua, stop me if you were going to cover this anyway, but I wanted to quickly state um, a, a difference between LastPass, 1Password, and KeyPass. KeyPass sure stores, stores your data on your computer, which on the one hand, is very safe unless somebody steals your computer and, and uh, is able to get into your computer itself. However, remember what I said earlier about not having any piece of data exist in only one place. There is a danger if you're not backing up that key pass file that if your computer becomes damaged, you may lose all your passwords. One password and last pass both have built in or as add-ons the ability to sync your passwords across multiple devices. Uh, LastPass itself is based in, is a web-based service, which means that you can access it from anywhere, and unless you lose your main password for it, you cannot lose your data. And I also wanted to say, and Keith, Keith sent me this video as well, and Keith, I'd also received that video from actually about three other people, I guess when you're doing a webinar on password management, people are keen. Um, there was a video that came out, it's about a three and a half minute animated cartoon that talks about passwords and password managers. It's almost like a three and a half minute version of this webinar, although obviously there's this fair amount of content uh, cut out. And uh, we have that in the resource link. And it, it talks about what I would say is the biggest question that we'll get, which I'm not going to address 
things directly other than point people to the animation because it covers it well. Uh, well, but what if I put all my passwords in a password manager and then my password manager gets breached? Isn't that really dangerous and bad? And the short answer is, of course, that's a problem and you don't want that to happen. But the net gain in security that you get from having strong passwords that aren't reused, that you can audit, that are managed by one system, that you you know have protection against phishing and all these other things, the net gains vastly outweigh the sort of dangers of that one system getting getting uh, breached. Also, you can now expend quite a bit more energy protecting just that one system because you don't have to expend that same level of energy on you know the 107 credentials that you have out there because your password manager is doing that for you. And that's the sort of rough version of that. All right, so. Can I uh, make one, oh, go more, ahead. Yeah, go ahead. one more point, Joshua, and that is to put it in a slightly different way, there's no such thing as perfect security. There's no such thing as perfect anything. But in the world of IT security, we don't compare the excellent with the perfect. We compare the excellent with what the alternative is. And if using a password manager uh, that's web-based helps you practice good password hygiene, it's sure better than having your password for every single thing you use be password or one, two, three, four, five, six. Yep. All right, so password manager basics. Uh, so cr they create complex and random passwords. It's literally the job of a password manager is to do that. And, and you can literally set your last password, key password ever to generate 100 character passwords for every website that you come across and have them all be alphanumeric with lots of random characters and things like that. They are, generally speaking, quite inexpensive. And by that, LastPass Personal is a walloping, everybody wait for it, $12 a year, a dollar a month for LastPass Personal, uh, the professional version. And by the way, it's free if you don't need some features like needing it on your phone and stuff like that. Um, and for enterprise versions, it's still like 30 bucks a person a year. And if you're a nonprofit, you get that down to something like $20 per person per year. So these are not expensive tools. Ben, uh, who's with us, who's, who's doing the tech behind the scene, you may hear from him later, uh, he made the point that Yahoo's sale to Microsoft just, uh, just completed, and they got a, Microsoft got a discount to the tune of $350 million, specifically because of the breaches that Yahoo had. So when you talk about you know, $30 a year per staff person that they could have paid for password managers that might have saved a breach, you know, that's uh, <laughs> something of a savings. All right, uh, password managers will protect against phishing attacks. And I'm not going to get deep into the technicals of how they do that, but essentially uh, password managers will only automatically put the passwords in uh, for a site that is the actual website that it, it knows is there. So it can't get fooled by a fraudulent website because it won't be at the URL or the exact web address um, that it's looking for. Now you could still, you know, go copy your credential out of your password manager and, you know, enter it into a phishing attack. You could still manage to breach your password, you know, if you worked around what your what your password manager was doing. But the password manager itself can protect you against phishing, and it can audit all your passwords. And I've gotten there a sample LastPass security score, so it can tell you, you know, how many passwords have been part of breaches, uh, how many of your passwords are weak, how many have been reused, how many are old, all that good stuff. So um, you had asked Joshua, or maybe Ben had, whether I would answer Stan's question. Shall I take that on? Uh, Stan's uh, question. I did, I did yeah, about uh, about the <clears throat> excuse me, the last pass breach that happened last year. Oh yeah, and the, um, the video actually covers that, and that's why I didn't want to get deep into that. So the video link that I sent Stan actually covers the last pass breach and why, even though. Um, LastPass got breached. LastPass customers, the, the net net is that all LastPass customers had to do was change their LastPass master password. Their, the passwords within their vault were actually not breached as part of that, if you can believe that, which is uh, part of how LastPass handles their security. So even though it's not great that, that people had to change their passwords, uh, their, all the passwords within their vault were not breached. And they've also implemented. Uh, they've also implemented some extra uh, requirements when signing in from a new device, which is how the breach actually happened, uh, to prevent uh, that that kind of breach from happening again. So that's. And as Keith said before, and I think he uh, you know articulated it quite eloquently, there is there is no perfect security, and you know 
So when something happens, you learn from it, you make a change, and that's how security gets better, right? Uh, Keith, did we cover everything you wanted to say there? I apologize. The, the one other thing I would just add is that, and we've kind of alluded to it, but I want to say it specifically, and that is that when LastPass did get breached, all the attackers saw was encrypted data, meaning gibberish. So you can assume that the password managers themselves are using advanced encryption. All right, and uh, Ben also corrected me in the chat, or you need to, uh, oh, that was just the organizer, sorry. It was Verizon, uh, not Microsoft, that bought Yahoo. So my apologies for that, Verizon bought Yahoo. Apologies uh, if, if stocks, if the market just took wild swings because of me saying that on this webinar. I hope I didn't uh, impact the world markets too much. All right, so I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, single sign-on which also gets tossed around as a term, or SSO, which also gets tossed around as a term within password managers and that, just to explain that there are different services. And we're not gonna get deep into single sign-ons today because I, I, I felt like I wanted to give more time to two-factor authentication, which is gonna be what we're gonna roll into next. But I did wanna just give people a breakout. Um, some of the popular single sign-on services, one password is one, last password can function as a single sign-on service. Okta, O-K-T-A, is probably the most popular current single sign-on solution that lots of folks use. And the differences between a password manager, which we've talked about a lot, is the password managers are used predominantly by individuals, that they, those individuals can be part of organizations, and the individual password manager accounts can be managed by an organization, an enterprise, which is what Keith is doing at, at Freedom House with LastPass. Uh, password managers generate and manage passwords. They can log in automatically, especially with browser plugins. They, you could, they provide a means to share your credentials with someone else securely. So if I want, and this is a, another important feature of password managers, let's say I, I want Ben to have access to my Roundtable Twitter account so that he can post tweets on behalf of me for, for Roundtable. Um, I can, using LastPass, share my credential with Ben and either let him see the password or not, right? I can just, but if his last pass can still authenticate him to Twitter as me with that share, even if I don't let him see the password. And then at any time I want, I can revoke that from Ben and say, Ben, you know, I've, I'm done with needing, needing the tweet, so I revoke it. He's never even seen my password, and so he can't possibly log in as me anymore. Uh, and also, uh, if we're sharing that, it's a secure way to share it. So we don't have to deal with emailing it to each other or texting each other or writing it down or all these things. So it's a very important thing. Uh, and they can uh, store private credentials. So when you're using something like LastPass Enterprise within an organization, the individuals can actually use it for their personal passwords and have those not be in any way exposed to the organization. They have a private vault which is theirs and theirs alone to use. So by implementing password management for your organization, you can not only increase your organizational security, but increase the personal security of the individuals that work at your organization, which I think is pretty awesome. Keith, you sounded like you, you had something to say. I do have something else to say. Um, one ahead. other feature of good password managers is that they include a, ra a random password generator. So in fact, you know, Joshua and I both talked about having upwards of 200 or even upwards of 300 accounts that we've got passwords for. In principle, the only passwords we need to remember are the ones to log onto our computer itself and to log into LastPass. All the other passwords I have stored in there are random, as long as I want them to be. For me, I default to 30 characters with all four character types, uppercase, lowercase, numbers, and symbols. And I only need to create that sort of passphrase approach for LastPass itself and for my computer. This means that everything is really highly secure. It's very difficult to impossible for even the most sophisticated computer systems or hacker systems to break through passwords of that length. Unfortunately, there still are sites out there that won't allow you to create passwords longer than 12 or 15 characters. So in those cases, you use the random password generator and set your length to that. Thank you, Keith. Uh, I, I go to super nerd lengths and actually use the random password generator to generate uh, security question answers as well. <laughs> so if you want to go yeah. way <laughs> overboard, you can, uh, and you can use that as well. that's a great tip. Uh, that's a really great tip. You know those security questions, things like your mother's maiden name or what city you met your, your spouse in. 
you, they don't have to be truthful answers. You just have to have a record of what answer you gave. That's an excellent, excellent security tip. And and I, I had not want to include some of that stuff in here because it's just you know, I have to just decide what we can cover in a half an hour and reasonably expect people to start doing. But uh, but those are excellent, excellent tips that Ben and Keith are giving you guys. So uh, so I just want to very quickly cover single sign-on. So the, the, what single sign-on is, is where it's different is that it simplifies provisioning and deprovisioning, which is a fancy way of saying when we have a new hire and when someone leaves. And what that does, let's say we are we have an organization, we use Office 365, we use Salesforce, um, and we use Active Directory. And so we're using all three of those different sort of authentication systems. And currently, when someone comes on to our organization, we have to create an Active Directory account, we then have to create an Office 365 account, and we then have to create a Salesforce account. We have to create three different credentials for each of those things three different usernames for each of those things, and then communicate each of these things to the staff person. Now the staff person has to go change each of those three credentials. They have to put them in whatever system they have, right? It's a big pain, and then you multiply that times five or 10 or however many systems you actually have. So what Okta or other single sign-on services do is you simply create the person in one place, in Okta, and create one credential. And Okta goes and creates all the other accounts. And the person simply logs into Okta, and Okta authenticates them to all the other systems. So they actually don't even know their passwords to those other systems. They never get them. They don't need to know them. What they need to know is how to authenticate to Okta, or that single sign-on service. It is a very good thing, if you, especially if you have a lot of cloud services. And then when you onboard someone, you simply you know, set them up in Okta, and all the other accounts get created and provisioned. And when you offboard them, you remove them from Okta, and all the other accounts get deprovisioned. So that if you, especially if you're a larger organization, this can save you a ton of work and also make you quite a bit more secure. All right, key success factors. And by the way, we're we're running we're going to run at least probably five or ten minutes long on this one today. I apologize to everybody. We've always left that half an hour of Q and A uh, open, so the so we're out till three. I don't think we'll go all the way till three, but just given folks who are worrying about time, a heads up, we we are going to run a little long today. I apologize. So key success factors for password managers. So obviously a strong master passwords using two-factor authentication, which we're going to talk about next, even better. Strong change management and support. So Keith, who's implemented this at Freedom House, can talk about what that means. I'll give him a couple of minutes to do that. And of course, regular reporting and use monitoring, meaning you know, are people using the password manager that we have? Uh, and are they putting passwords into the system? And are they using secure passwords? And then giving time. So you're not going to implement a password manager for your organization tomorrow or for yourself tomorrow, and then the next day have nine, every single password that you use in that system. But over time, as you log into different sites, as you authenticate the different things, the password manager will pick those things up, will start to notice that, hey, this is a password you've reused before, this is a weak password, this password is part of a breach, will change them for you to some randomly generated 100 character string, and over time, your systems will get much more secure. So that's those are the key success factors. And Keith, I, I'll let you give you a minute or two here to talk about the, the change management and support experience from, from Freedom House. Well, first of all, change management, anyone who is on the line who's responsible for IT knows that change management is essential, meaning that you have to have incentives, ways to show people who are going to embrace change, you have to show that it helps them directly. Um, we're not perfect in this, and in fact, I have been preaching last pass to the choir here for four years, and I'd say that we have about 25% adoption. There are those in the organization who need to have access to shared password resources for enterprise level stuff. Those people have no choice, and they've got to adopt it. But for the others, hey, all I can do is continue to remind them that security is paramount and that this is a solution that they can all use. I also pitch this very um, very clearly, not only for use within Freedom House, but also in their personal lives. Awesome, thanks Keith. And I'm just sharing a link um, that uh, some, well actually I'll save that for later, okay. Okay, we have our uh, next uh, poll here, which is two-factor authentication. So we wanna know, if Ben, you can pop this up. Do you use two-factor authentication in your for any of your personal accounts? So do you use two-factor authentication for any of your personal accounts, for Gmail, for, for anything else like that? And go ahead and put in those responses. We'll give it just uh, another few seconds here and 
let some more folks get in. And then Ben, if you want to go ahead and close that up and show us the results. And again, we've got uh, a few more people using two-factor than using password managers, so that's a good thing. So a third of us are using two-factor authentication for four or more personal accounts. Good for you guys. That is awesome. Uh, weirdly, no one just using it for one account. Everybody who's, who's picked up two-factor authentication on the webinar has, has decided to go for it for more than one account, which is also great. Uh, and uh, before now, a few people didn't even know about it. So that's, uh, that's you're going to know about it right now. We're going to jump into it. All right, so Ben, go ahead and close that up. And we're going to talk about two-factor authentication. So let's, let's consider the different ways to authenticate. And two-factor authentication, by the way, is a subset of multi-factor authentication. And when we talk about multi-factor, MFA, there are fundamentally three different methods you can use to authenticate to a system. So the one method is something you know, which is historically the only thing we've used, a username, a password, right? So I know this information in my head, and I use it to authenticate to a system. Um, another uh, option, too, is something you have, and we are all quite familiar with authenticating to a system with something we have. Anytime we open our house or apartment with a key, right, we are only using one factor, but it's a different factor than the one that we use to log into our computer at work, right? It's a factor of one, which is a key that I have with me, right, so something I have. Um, and then three is something you are, or a thing, you know, biometric information, essentially, fingerprints, voice recognition, etc. And the, the most common a uh, way that, that we add two-factor authentication at the moment is through using your mobile phone as the something you have component. And there's a few different ways you can do that, although increasingly we're seeing biometric as an option, and we're also seeing different ways of using uh, something you have. So let's, let's get into what those are. So here's the, the most common methods of two-factor authentication that, that we're, are currently in, in most of you who have used two-factor will recognize each of these. So fingerprint, anyone who's got an iPhone may recognize that, which is if you enable touch ID, which is using your thumb or a finger um, as a means of authenticating, then you can use that as a means of authenticating to different applications on your phone or different services. So that's one, something you are. All right, SMS, which is where you register with a service and you have it text you anytime you try to log in. And then you, in addition to putting in a username and a password, you now have to put in the six digit or eight digit code that is texted to you to your mobile device, which is the thing you have. So that's where it requires the thing you have. And then an authenticator app, and that's the Google authenticator that you're looking at there, but there's also Authy, LastPass has its own authenticator app. Microsoft has an authenticator app. Um, and what was the one that you, uh, Duo, was that the one that you liked the best, Keith? Uh, we use Duo Security at Freedom House. Reason why okay. we like it, first of all, we work with uh, some very advanced security advisors who f think that it is better than the other tools out there in terms of the way Duo itself manages their data. The other thing that we like about it is we're able to use it for a variety of applications. We require two-factor authentication for all people working outside the office to uh, access remote desktop and for our webmail. We also require it for all website editors, whether they're working in office or out, and also for our Slack instance. Um, you can configure Duo to work with a number of tools. There are a lot of APIs for it. Awesome. Thank you, Keith. So those are the most common methods currently. I'm going to take a little bit just to talk about uh, another, and I apologize for throwing all these acronyms, U2F, or Universal Two-Factor Authentication, which is a means of using a physical key that you stick into the USB slot, um, and then they have a, a wireless interface that you can use if you need to authenticate to something on a mobile device, like a tablet or a phone that doesn't have a USB slot. Uh, and the reason I'm going to talk about this, even though they're, they're not in a lot of use, is you'll see in a moment. Um, so one thing is that they're pretty inexpensive to implement. So we talked about like a password manager or something like that being $30 or $20 a year, right? Uh, a, a U2F key or a YubiKey can range anywhere from about $20 to $50 for the key itself. And then there's no cost after that, um, unless you lose the key and you need to replace it. Um, from a security perspective, they are considered the most secure form of two-factor authentication for a variety of reasons that are technical, but they completely make phishing not a problem. The user cannot um, 
to get fished if you're using one of these keys. These keys the, the, the completely thwarts any kind of phishing attack. And there's another kind of attack, which I'm not going to get into here, but it's called a man-in-the-middle attack, which, uni which uh, other forms of two-factor authentication can still be vulnerable to. Uh, U2F keys are not vulnerable to that. Um, the other thing, as, as kind of shown by this grid, so you've got the like authenticator apps and SMS that we just showed in the right in the middle of this grid, right? That's the smartphone, and then you've got the biometric. You'll notice that it's not as highly secure, uh, even though it is simple and low cost. Um, and the YubiKey or or U2F keys are super easy to use because you carry it around with you and when you need to authenticate you simply plug it in and you're authenticated and as long as you physically have that key with you that's that's it from a user perspective super easy they're extremely durable as well so other than being lost and in case anyone's wondering if you lose them uh, it's not like everything's compromised you simply register that the key is lost and it stops working uh, so I don't want to spend too much time talking about them but one of the reasons I, I'm just including the slide here is most of the major um, kind of what we think of the cloud service companies. So oh, I can see my dial pads down there. Sorry about that. <laughs> All right, let me quit that. There we go. Sorry about that, everybody. Um, so Facebook, Google, Salesforce, Dropbox, uh, CERN Labs, and I, I include a link there for all the other customers. They're all using this for their regular staff. So their regular staff are not using, you know, SMS-based or authenticator-based two-factor authentication to log in at Facebook. They are using U2F keys. So if you want to know what the sort of best practices are at the moment. Key success factors for two-factor authentication. So obviously start with your most critical services. Um, have testing groups, so work with groups first. Uh, the Authenticator app is preferable to SMS. It is definitely more secure to use an Authenticator app. Uh, the Duo service that the Keith mentioned, or the Google Authenticator, or Authy, or any one of those. Uh, and then if you're really security conscious, if you think you have really significant you know, threat models at your organization, consider U2F, and then of course training support, training support, rinse, repeat, all that good stuff. One more note, Joshua, about yeah, why sure. SMS is not the most secure approach, and that is that uh, voice and SMS data on mobile phones are inherently open. Correct. Yep. All right. Um, although we're going to talk about that, it's like you set me up for the next session, but uh, that's okay. <laughs> there is a mitigation for that, and we're going to talk about that in the next session in two weeks. But uh, for now, what we want to do is launch our last poll, and, and then we are done, so we didn't run too far over, but we ran about uh, 10 minutes over here. What is your biggest challenge concern around password management? Of course, you can enter stuff in the chat. So you think it's reused passwords? Do you think it's weak passwords? Do you think it's shared passwords, compromised passwords? Um, if you have other things, Please enter them into the chat. I'm, I'm just, uh, I'm trying to end each of these sessions just with a sense of like where are people struggling the most, where do they need the most help, and then you can go ahead and close it up and show the results. Uh, so it's that's more or less in line with what I thought. Let's see what people are uh, are putting in the chat. Um, so, Joshua, apologies. And, oh, go ahead. Yeah. I was just going to say I'm part of the reason why we're running over here, but I just wanted to say when I onboard new staff. Uh, two things, a couple of things that I tell them is one, don't reuse the same password for more than one item. You'd be surprised how many people in my onboarding have never heard that tip before. The other thing is not to share passwords with anybody whose own password management and hygiene you don't trust. Yep. And another thing that I see that's very common in organizations, and I, and I see IT people honestly guilty of this like so much is, they have like literal spreadsheets of passwords. Like they literally create passwords for people and do not let them change them. Um, this anybody who's not an admin at an organization, you know, and and has worries about this. If you want to, and, and I apologize if I get you in trouble, but if you're working in an organization like that, um, you have my permission to tell your IT person. This guy Joshua said like that is wrong and that is a horrible practice and they can call me if they want to talk about it. <laughs> but your IT administrator should not know your password. And that is 100% true, and they should never know your password, and they should not ask for it. And if I need to get into someone's system, I will ask them to reset their password to something that you know we can both share, and then I will go log into their system, and then I, when I'm done, I will say, now go please change your password back to something I don't know. That's the best possible way that would work. 
but you, there's no reason you need to share your password even with an administrator. So just want to make that point. All right, Ben, let's go ahead and close up the poll. And Thank you, everybody, for that. Just a, a quick point there. <clears throat> Excuse me. Just to clarify, if you are a Roundtable customer and we use LogMeIn to access your computer, we are using a username and password that we have created, and we hold that password. We don't actually use your personal password. So just because <laughs> sure I, yeah, I yeah. can yeah. receive hey, a reply saying, hey, why do you know our password? Yeah, so. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, we do not keep like personal customer passwords. We have our own administrative credential that we're using. We are not we, we are not using your credential. So here's some resources. Uh, the animation that we talked about before, warning is a little bit of bad language at the end of that. So just a heads up in case anyone's sense of that sort of thing. Uh, a nice little article on single sign-on solutions and challenges. And for those of you who want to get jiggy with two-factor authentication, 12 days of two-factor authentication from the wonderful Electronic Frontier Foundation. They will give you very clear instructions on how to set up two-factor authentication of 12 of the most popular services like Facebook, LinkedIn, uh, Gmail, Office 365, Dropbox, Salesforce, etc. So you can go get your two-factor set up on all of those different services. Thank you all so much for, for sticking around with us today. The next session is going to be March 7th. And it is the at dollar sign pound. I'm going to have to figure out a way to pronounce this, right? So obviously, I'm, well, probably not. Obviously, I'm just a complete nerd. But that's a, making fun of the ABCs of encryption, <laughs> communication, information, and device encryption basics. And we will talk about if you are using SMS uh, for two-factor authentication, you could maybe use an encrypted MMS, SMS, like Signal. And that might make that a little bit more secure for you. So we'll talk about some of those things. And that's coming up in two weeks. Thank you so much to Keith for joining us today. Round of applause to Keith. Thank you so much, Keith. And we will now take questions. And I'm happy, Keith, I don't know what your time is like. I am, I am set till 3, so I will stick around until we have answered all the questions. You are welcome to flee uh, any time that you uh, feel it's appropriate. I, um, I am committed to staying on this webinar for the rest of my life. Awesome. Perfect. All right. And keep breathing. Uh, so, and Beth uh, shared another uh, a video on, on passwords. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, type that in. I just needed, I would have typed that in right away. I just wanted to go make sure it wasn't anything uh, strange. Every once in a while we have uh, vendors that will sit in on these and throw in links. So, uh, so Beth, thank you for sharing that. Um, whoops, I only shared it to the organizers though. It probably helps if I share it to the whole audience. So I will do that. And let's go ahead and take a look at the questions here. All right, so Keith, is there anything that jumps out around you, jumps out for you in terms of? It's it's probably worth answering Beth's question about uh, websites that don't accept complex passwords to the, the wider group if, if everybody didn't see that. Um, uh, this is Keith. I addressed that um, a little bit earlier, okay. which is that there are websites that limit you to 12 character or 15 character passwords. You still, and I, I may not be aware of all the limitations you're seeing, Beth, but on those sites, I still have been able to use a mix of uppercase, lowercase numbers and symbols, and I use the maximum length that they allow. Was there something else that you were referring to? We'll uh, wait a second to see if Beth pops any, uh, any questions in there. And uh, so if anyone does have questions, just go ahead and enter them into the, uh, the questions section of the uh, uh, thing we've got one here from Michael. We'll go ahead and get that. So, with what password change frequency do you recommend? Was it every 60 days? So, we'll see if Keith and Ben and I all agree on this. I always think this is fun to see if uh, who wants to answer first, and then we'll see if everybody agrees. I'm happy to throw my hat in the ring first and, and let you guys make fun of me. But I actually have an answer ready. Go ahead. Um, we require at Freedom House that one's main network password, which is also the email password. Uh, gets changed every 60 days. My general advice when I'm uh, onboarding new users is that in their personal lives and for their other professionally related accounts, that the frequency depends on the sensitivity, sensitivity of the thing in question. So in my personal life, I might not update my Netflix password for uh, even more than a year, but something like a bank account, I'll update that every 90 days to six months. Oh. I actually go far more frequent with my bank stuff. Uh, with any any yeah. banking or credit card information, usually uh, I have a reminder uh -huh. every time I get a statement, I update my password. It's part of my process when I go online and review my charges and things. I usually update my password. Um, so it might be a little bit of an overkill, but uh, I, I'm 
Better safe than sorry. <laughs> All right. And just, my and, view. And just for those of you who haven't been to one of my webinars before, I want I want this to mention before I answer this myself is that I encourage dissension among our panelists and encourage debate. I think it's healthy for audience members to hear that even you know professionals and you know quote unquote experts in these realms don't necessarily agree on the best approach, that that there aren't necessarily hard and fast rules in time. So as long as we're all respectful of each other, you know, it's 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 okay for us to disagree. Having said that, I'm going to say that I am not a big fan of expiring passwords frequently and perhaps not at all. Uh, I think that complexity and length are absolutely critical and that's much more important than frequency of changing. Um, also, not reusing passwords is much more critical than frequency of changing. And when you increase the frequency of the changes, you increase the likelihood of these other bad practices leaking in. If people starting to reuse passwords, put in weaker passwords, uh, and get frustrated, not use complex passwords. So I uh, don't, you know, I'm okay with people setting like a year uh, for for expirations for systems or even no expiration, although I'm not a huge fan of that, um, as long as they have these other systems in place. Fundamentally, uh, two-factor authentication and using password managers are really what you need to do if you want to get serious about this stuff. Uh, so that's, that's my answer. Joshua, this is this is Keith. I just want to weigh in and say I largely agree with you, and even some of our hired security advisors disagree with each other on this stuff. There's <laughs> one good explanation I've heard for why changing passwords on some regular basis is a good idea, and that is that some ha hackers will collect passwords but not use them right away. And yep. so if a hacker has been storing your password for six months, but you already changed it before that, then they can't get it. Yep. All right, um, I'm gonna throw a link in here for Deborah. Um, let's see, I'll put send to all. So Deborah asked the question about, is there a way you can tell all the places where you have credentials? It's not super easy actually um, to, to know all the places where you have a credential. That's where that time when I talked about the best password managers, uh, best practices or success factors for password managers when giving time. If you start using a password manager today, it will, you know, notice every time you log into a site and offer to, you know, save that in its system. And over time, you will start to now have this register of all the places where you are. Uh, I've also thrown a link in there called Have I Been Pwned, which is you can type in an email address and see if there's an account that's been part of any breach that's tied to that address. Uh, I will periodic last pass. Uh, uses a similar database and will tell you if your credentials have been part of any breach. So I, I let LastPass do that for me, but that's a quick way you can see if any of your credentials have been part of any breach. And if you find that it's been part of a breach and you haven't changed that password, or God help you, you reuse that password at other sites, which you probably wouldn't know, uh, you can at least know about that. Uh, but Deborah, I don't really have a good way for you to find all the accounts that are registered to an email address other than to today, Start using a password manager, and every time you log into a site, let the password manager save that credential for you, and then start looking at what your security scores look like and how many reused passwords you have, stuff like that. Keith or Ben, I don't know if you have any other suggestions. There. I have um, one thing about the password manager functionality. I, again, actively use 1Password and LastPass. LastPass actually has built in. Uh, um, and we, you saw it briefly earlier, you can have it tell you how, how good your password hygiene is and suggest to you which passwords ought to be changed. LastPass also can notify you when it thinks it's time for you to change a password. And last uh, but not least, LastPass also has some functionality that it can automatically log into a site and change a password for you, though I found it does not work with all sites. I don't see any of that functionality in one password unless I'm missing it. All right, and we've got a question from Roberta who said about updating, including those in the last pass, and I'm asking for a clarification on that question because I wasn't totally clear. It, I think what she's asking is should we, you know, update passwords even if they're stored in LastPass? And one of the cool things about LastPass or 1Password or KeyPassword is they can actually go and update passwords for you on lots of systems, which is kind of cool and also kind of scary, but mostly cool. 
uh, and they'll just go ahead and take the password that hopefully you have no idea what it is because it was a randomly generated 30 character string that was generated by your password manager and change it to some other randomly password, randomly generated 30 character string that is also created by the password manager and you get a little notification that your password was changed. If you have two-factor authentication set up, maybe you have to put that in to enable the password to be changed in your good to go from there. Um, so I hope that helps. Uh, but yes, you, you do probably still want to update those passwords. But um, again, I'm much more concerned with getting rid of the weak passwords, getting rid of the passwords that were part of breaches, and getting rid of reused passwords, and replacing all of those with nice, long, complex passwords, which only a password manager can really do effectively. And then again, enabling two-factor authentication. If, if uh, six months from now, everybody that was part of this webinar was using a password manager and had two-factor authentication and five or more accounts, I would be such a happy person. Uh, so. Yeah, the, the other thing to consider as well, um, Roberta, is that um, not all organizations and even business types are required to report breaches in a uniform way. So um, there, there may be instances where a website that you have used was breached, but they haven't actually issued a press release or anything like that. So uh, although having that password being complex and any password manager is good uh, management, there's still a chance that it it, it, uh, it may have been compromised. So, um, you know, just like we like uh, Keith has been um, talking about, just practicing good hygiene with those passwords, um, kind of a, a continuous improvement is always going to be the best way to um, to to stay kind of one step ahead of um, uh, of those breaches. So. Awesome. And with that, we are we are done with questions. So we're going to go ahead and wrap up. Uh, Keith and Ben and I will be staying here on the webinar. We're going to stop the recording and just start chatting amongst ourselves. So if anyone feels like eavesdropping on our debrief, you're welcome to just you know hang out. But this is the end of the webinar, and everybody may depart now.